Hello and welcome to a brand new show of Market Makers. It's quite impressive the way in which Indian markets have managed to climb the wall of worry. Indian markets have shrugged off all the global cues, be it Greece, China, what's happening in Brazil and Russia. So why are Indian markets so resilient? And can we continue to move independently of the global backdrop? To discuss all that and much more, I have uh, with me a very special guest, market veteran indeed, Nilesh Shah of Kota KMC. Nilesh, fantastic to have you back and thank you for joining us. For the first time, I'm impressed with what Indian markets have done. Earlier, anything went wrong in the world, we were the first ones to crack and the first ones to react. Uh, we've, bulls indeed have managed to climb the wall of worry. See, essentially, experience make people wiser. There is a host of people in local market as well as global markets who have learned in 2008 very hard way that when you sold at 15,000 Sensex, 12,000 Sensex, 10,000 Sensex, and 8,000 8, Sensex, yeah. <laughs> Because there was a problem occurring in the global markets, uh, they paid a heavy price for it. So now people have become smart enough to learn from that previous experience that if an isolated thing happens in a country like Greece, that's not going to have material impact in India. However, if that isolated event leads to a contention effect, then probably there will be some short-term adverse impact on our market. But as of today, market is wiser from their experience. But in a globalized, connected world where everything and everything is connected through machines or through human interaction, can Indian markets move independently? Definitely not in the short term. But over a longer period of time, the fundamentals will prevail. And if you look at the Greece problem, I think on one side, the problem is that if they facilitate Greece to stay in Euro, then will the other weaker economies demand the same kind of treatment? And if they allow Greece to go out of Euro, then will the market take a call that if European Union is not comfortable protecting their weak link, will the same treatment be meted out to other weaker links? So it's a kind of question which is very difficult to get answered. For last five years, we have been hearing this Greece saga, yeah. and every day there is a twist and a turn. I don't think so. This is something which is going to come to an end in a hurry. In 91, we were, ha we were having you know, similar problems. What did we do? We reduced our fiscal deficit, essentially wasteful expenditure. We raised our interest rates to attract foreign capital. We opened our economy to you know, get foreign capital. We liberalized our economy in terms of license permit raj. We let our currency depreciate so that we can be competitive in exports. Now, can Greece become competitive in exports through currency depreciation? No. Can they cut their wasteful expenditure and reduce their subsidy? That's what the European Union is demanding. Now, they have already implemented that in part, mm. but that's not yielding the result yet. It's a very small economy. It's very a very inward small economy, economy, very inward-looking economy, and it's a, you know, kind of giving lots of bonanza, lots of subsidies to its citizens. When you retire at the age of 57 and you get full-time pension, there are 450 you know, professions which are called hazardous professions, and there you can retire at the age of 50 and yet demand full pension. Now, when a country starts giving so much doles to its people, certainly at some point of time, one, one has to pay the price as well. But I really worry about the political ramifications, and the political ramifications are that what really will happen to austerity? Uh, what has happened to Greece, the same thing will happen to Spain, it will happen to Portugal, it will happen to Italy. They will also come out and demand their pound of flesh. They will also start uh, you know, urging for debt forgiveness. So where are we headed? I mean, that's a larger question. So in Gujarati, we have a very nice proverb that if an old woman dies, that's not the problem. The problem is that the Yamdut will come and see our house. So today, European Union is facing similar dilemma with Greece. Greece is small economy. It can be contained. But if they give too much of benefit to Greece in terms of debt write-offs, then tomorrow, Spain, Portugal, Italy exactly. may demand the same treatment. And if they don't protect Greece, then markets will take a negative outlook on Spain, Greece, and uh, Spain, Portugal, and Italy and then that negative outlook itself will precipitate into the crisis. So broadly, whatever is happening in the world, be it China, last year it was Brazil and Russia, and right now it is Greece, uh, that's good news for India, isn't it? 
essentially now we can go and tell the world that for majority of last 20 years, Greece credit rating was higher than India. Look at the problems of Greece visa with India. So go by fundamentals, go by the growth potential, and just don't go by what is the you know exteriors of a country. So my guess is that all this kind of troubles happening in the rest of the world will be beneficial to us in terms of allocation. Then why are they, then why are FI selling down, selling the exposure down? Right now they should be buying into Indian stocks with both their hands because there is a lot of global liquidity. The global liquidity earlier was let's say moving into China. It was moving into certain parts of Europe, but that trade uh, has reversed. So a very lighter vein answer is that look when there was a great uh, you know, deal on a pharma company stock at a, some discount to prevailing market price, one could place paper of more than two and a half billion dollar in 24 hours. So you have quality companies at a quality price and you raise two and a half billion dollar plus in 24 hours. The serious point is that it will be unfair to expect that FIIs will continue to invest on a daily basis. But at the same time, we should also look at what kind of base we are creating on the domestic side. Last year, mutual funds invested about 70,000 odd crore into equity market. Over next five years, I wouldn't be surprised if they bring in 350,000 crore into the market. So the domestic institutional investors, people like you, you are the real price makers now. Let's not get fascinated with this Gora money word. No, we are still small in size. So compared to FII, which own 25% of the market, we are just owning about three, three and a half percent. If I had insurance and banks, we are probably just about 10%. But incrementally, we believe we are creating a base which will be in a position to stand with the FIIs in terms of you know, participating in the market. So Greece, no Greece, where are markets headed? So more than the Greece, our markets will be influenced in the near term by three things. First is the monsoon. July monsoon is very crucial for the agriculture growth and rural economy. Now, June monsoon has been good, contrary to prediction by IMD. We need the same trend to continue in July because July rainfall will be supporting agriculture growth as well as the rural economy. The second is the monsoon session of parliament. In this session, clearly there are bills which are necessary from pushing economic reforms forward. The GST bill, the land acquisition bill. If those bills get passed, then definitely it will be supportive to the market. It will give confidence to the investors that yes, India is on the growth path, India is on the reform path. The third and the most important thing is the quarterly results. Yeah. The December 14, 14 quarterly results were below expectation. March 15 quarterly results were below expectation. They were way below expectation. They were <laughs> even lower than the yeah. lowered expectations. Yeah. And the June 15 quarter, we haven't begun yet as well. And Some expectations are low. Technology companies have already started lowering their guidance. So clearly, most crucial thing for market is, will June be different from March and December? Will we see just about 10, 12% earnings growth in June 15 on a year-on-year -year basis? Will we see some of the defensives, you know, delivering up to their mm. expectation? So monsoon, parliament, and the results, these are the things which will impact far, impact market far more than what's happening in Greece. See, monsoon, I'll have to look up. I guess both of us have no answer. Let's talk about earnings, something which we can predict and something which we can analyze at least on our laptops. Uh, in general, expectations are that Q1 numbers will not be strong. Currency volatility, commodity volatility, and IT companies. They're three big variable factors. So if numbers are not strong, uh, can markets correct? Or a poor Q1 is already, is already in the price? So market has not fully discounted poor Q1. There are certain emerging signs which is giving confidence to the market that you know numbers could be brighter. One, the government has spent more money in the month of April and May. The June numbers are not yet out, but my guess is that the trend will continue. The government has also collected almost 39% more revenue in the first two months. This can't happen unless until economy is vibrant. So the government spending should resonate into the economy in terms of better economic yeah. activity and hence higher corporate earnings. The second thing which market is also seeing is the IIP numbers and core infrastructure numbers. Those numbers are not you know, way high, but certainly there is an improving trend. Both these things put together gives confidence to the market that yes, the quarter one numbers should be ahead of expectation rather than below expectation. 
Now, will there be company specific events like what we are seeing in technology sector? The answer is obviously yes. But those should be exception, not the rule. But what's gone wrong with technology <coughs> suddenly? It's not just limited to large you know, mid-cap IT companies. A company like Tech Mahindra feels that they will struggle. I don't think the commentary from Wipro has been good and strong for the longest time I can remember. TCS, that's an odd one out. And HCL Tech has said that, look, they are also struggling. So as of today, what we are hearing from the corporate management is that these are client-specific issue, these are sector-specific issue. We haven't yet seen a pattern among this entire sector of you know, bad news. And most of the companies have talked about sector-related issue, like in telecom sector. Most of the companies have talked about client scaling back or client cutting down. There is no, not yet a pattern which is developing for the whole sector. If we see results from Accenture and Cognizant, clearly they are ahead of the Indian IT companies. And they are delivering that on a size. On a large basis. On a much larger base. So somewhere, you know, there are things which are happening company specific, hopefully not sector specific. But clearly there is a challenge for the Indian IT sector. They have to move towards what is called SMAC, yeah. social, social media, A company media, that cloud. persistent has already moved there and they are also struggling. So in some cases, the prices had run up way ahead of fundamentals and hence the necessary Are you a buyer in IT as we speak? I will rather wait for the June numbers to announce. I will see what the management commentary is, what the management guidance is, and then start accumulating. So where are your buyer as we speak? Our buying focus right now is, in, now is on domestic cyclicals. We believe we are at a trend where the government spending has begun. If last time the capex cycle was driven in power and telecom by private entrepreneurs, this time the capex cycle will be led by the government in road and railway and construction. So this is the sector where domestic cyclicals will benefit. They will have benefit of operating leverage, they will have benefit of financial leverage. We also believe we are at a stage where the borrowing cost of the borrowers, not necessarily in terms of policy rates, but in terms of actual transmission to the borrowers, will start declining over next two to three quarters. And tangible benefits of that will be reflected. So this operating and financial leverage and domestic cyclicals on back of government spending and lowering of interest rates in terms of borrowing cost and availability of liquidity gives us great opportunity but over Dilish, there. the thesis what you are painting was a thesis, this was a popular thesis about two quarters ago. Some of that thesis has got challenged. Rate cuts will not be that aggressive. The on-ground economic activity is yet to pick up. And government is spending, but it is in uh, you know drabs and dr drizzles. It's not big. Uh, we have to look at on a relative basis. Compared to last year, 100,000 crore will be spent. We believe this government will also be able to improve the efficiency of spending. So one, there is a quantum increase. Second, there is improvement in efficiency. Combination of this two should be in a position to give better earnings to corporate. The second thing, we are also witnessing a change in the business model. I mean, clearly, there is certain kind of consumption which is getting curtailed as the leakages in the government spending is getting stopped. So we have seen the pain of those leakages getting stopped, but we are yet to witness the benefit of those spending reaching out to the consumer. We will probably also have a good monsoon. One doesn't know what will be July, but if July rains are good, then we suddenly create a good platform through good monsoon, good government spending, your RBI's softer monetary policy with lower interest rates, all these things will add marginally to kickstart the investment cycle, to kickstart the operating leverage. Companies will have more cash. And then we will see, you know, slowly and steadily earnings coming back into the corporate. So the India. second half of this year for markets and for economy will be much better than uh, the first half of this calendar year. So we will have, again, an op optical illusion in the second half. Last year, second half, September 2014 to March 2015, Diwali was not that good, festival season was not that good, and corporate earnings actually crashed. Now this year, even if we have marginally better festival season, purely on a year-on-year -year basis, the numbers will start looking attractive. So we will benefit from the optical illusion of a year-on-year -year effect because last year, second half was quite bad.
I'm getting a sense that the market behavior also has changed. It's no longer pharmaceuticals which are leading the market action. Private banks are strong, but they're not no longer leading the market chart, so to speak. Energy stocks are back. Reliance is up 10-12% from the recent low. A stock like BPCL is sitting at a record high. PSU banks are off their lows. Do you think that there could be a sizable shift in uh, market behavior? It may not be restricted to uh, pharma and consumers only? See, eventually valuations catch up with everyone. And we have seen some beautiful correction in pharmaceutical stock, even correction in some of those multinational companies' stock. But my guess is that overall scenario still doesn't change. Yes, if we divide the market, they are in probably three parts. The expensive part is where multinational companies, certain FMCG and certain pharma companies are there. Now, because there is no supply, the stocks have continued to remain at a premium. And then stock-specific events results into correction. My feeling is that this side of the market, bearing few exceptions, will not be able to give market outperformance they will probably spend a little bit of time at current prices so that earnings can catch up with them. On the other hand, we also have a fairly cheap portfolio in the market. Most of the PSU banks, most of the leverage companies, most of the real estate companies, most of the infrastructure companies, they are all trading below book. Now, they are trading below book because there is burden of debt, there is burden of environment. There are events which has resulted in... But you are not ready to buy the dirty picture. I today don't have confidence to buy cheap stocks because I need to see events changing. In real estate, I need to see deleveraging. In real estate, I need to see stocks getting cleared even at a discounted price. Till such time that happens, how do I go and invest in real estate? In PSU banking system, I need to see how NPS will be cleared, mm-hmm. how capital will be provided to PSU bank, how they will attract talent to manage their show. So Unless PSU banks are cheap but still avoidable. Will they give 15-20% return on a, you know, someday? Probably, yes. But for PSU Bank, my mantra will be buy when they are very, very cheap and sell when they are cheap. Where are you investing right now for the long haul? Where are you allocating disproportionate amount of money? If you have to, let's say, allocate fresh $100 million, how would you allocate? Our focus will be on domestic cyclicals, private sector banks and NBFCs, and select mid-caps, which are more a domestic play rather than export play. What do you like in cyclicals? When I say cyclicals, it's a very long definition. There are companies which uh, would benefit because of power. There are some companies which would benefit only because of operating leverage. There are some companies which would benefit only because what is happening in the mining sector. So there it becomes more of a bottom-up stories. We believe, let's say, cement sector. Newer capacities are not coming. The time taken to set up new plant is almost double of what existing players have set up their plant. Third, the demand for cement is growing as government is spending money on road and railway. So from a capacity addition point of view, you are comfortable. From a demand point of view, you are comfortable. And clearly, as the capacity utilization starts improving in cement sector, we will see better profitability coming through. And yeah. cement can't be imported. So this gives a great moat to the current cement industry. You look at automobiles. When clearly, as interest rate come down, the rate-sensitive sectors like automobiles will benefit. More importantly, lack of public transport in India in most parts also is beneficial to the automobile sector. So again, automobile provides great opportunity. The other important thing which is happening in automobile sector is that as the base starts expanding, their component income also starts increasing. So that's kind of giving them some annuity and some wherewithal against the cyclicality. The replacement market base, certainly. Precisely. Hmm. These are the large themes, but what is that one mega trend which you are pursuing? Uh, frankly speaking, in today's market, there is no one big mega trend on which you know one can put money. There is no Y2K kind of scenario which pushes you to go for technology sector. There is no big pharma story left. I think the markets are no longer cheap. They are at fair value. And in this kind of market, in the hindsight, we'll probably know what is the big trend. But as of today, one will have to be selective and picking up stocks. The one trend which will emerge over a period of time is where the consumers are going to spend their next money. So we are below $1,000 per capita GDP, now moving from 1000 to 2000 In this stage, we will spend more money on education, on wellness, on travel and tourism. Clearly, these are the sectors 
where we will see new multi-bikers coming through. As of today, there are limited choices available over there. But over a period of time, I do see market capitalization of sectors like education, entertainment, travel and tourism, wellness and healthcare. That will multiply. There will be IPOs coming from you know companies in those sectors, and they will be the future multi-bikers for us. As we speak, and if I look at the Sensex, 40% broadly is financials, largely private banks. 17-18% is IT, then you've got pharmaceuticals, then you've got uh, energy stocks as well. In 2020, what kind of index do you think we could be staring at? Because the index has to change. If we see the liberalization era of 91 to 97, almost half of Sensex changed in that period. The 2015 to 2020 is not as uh, you know evolving period as 91-97, but certainly there will be changes in the composition of the benchmark indices there will be newer sectors which will come into them and those companies my feeling is more likely to be where the consumers are going to spend their next money it will be from education side it will be from wellness and healthcare side it will be from travel tourism and entertainment side if i look at the ipo bazaar the ipo activity has started and frankly this time i'm very impressed with the kind of names which were coming out whether it's indigo or a ccd or infibeam uh, are good days back for the ipo market if they can price ipos correctly then definitely good days are back when clearly everyone who is coming out with an ipo need to also realize that you know the promoters or the exiting shareholders are not the only guys who should make money. Mm. The incoming investor also should have pleasant experience. That's the fund manager in you. That's not the merchant banker in you. <laughs> <laughs> I've now changed the slide. <laughs> but as a merchant banker also, I was giving the same advice to my clients. Leave something on table for investors. The kind of goodwill which you create with that goes a long way in establishing your brand. The new element actually is the P element. And P investors never make, make sure that there's nothing left on the table. Not necessarily. I'm sure there are some smart PEs who realize that, you know, in the IPO, they are probably taking 30, 40, 50 percent exit. If they make 10 percent less over there, on the balance 50 percent, they'll make far more gain. So the market is evolving. You know, if people don't learn by choice, they will learn by experience. Today, I do foresee that the investors have become smart enough in valuing IPOs. They are not really chasing highly expensive IPOs. And we have seen a couple of IPOs actually being withdrawn because they couldn't gather the investor's appetite. Fair point. So final question, we are at 8,500 approximately on the Nifty, plus minus 50 points. What will it take for Nifty to go to 8,000? And similarly, what will push Nifty to 9,000? It's easier to predict what will take Nifty to 9,000 level. We need good monsoon, especially in July. We need productive sessions of parliament passing GST and land acquisition bill and couple of other bills. And most importantly, we need corporate earnings to make a turnaround in June 15 quarter. We need management to give guidance that the return on equity for India Inc. will improve from 13%, which was there in FY 2014, and probably 11, 12% in FY 2015. It is bottom and improving. These three things have come in our favor. We will see markets moving ahead. And if these three things disappoint, then there's no option but for market to So correct. June is, July is all about local queues. July is all about local queues. However, global events will continue to sparkle less and it will create an opportunity for us if there is a correction. I'm still very impressed in the way how markets have ignored Greece. I mean, the global backdrop is very, very messy. And hats off to bulls who mustered a lot of strength. They are also getting supported in the currency market as well as rates market. That's right. So really appreciate your time. Glad you could join us. Thank you. That's it on this edition of Market Makers. I'm Nikunj Dalma signing off. Thank you for watching the show. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.